how important is it to fight for different economic indicators in a moment like this? Because so long as GDP okay. is the measure of success, this will be wielded against us as a weapon. Definitely. I mean, there are um, people, I think it's important. And there are people like, there's a very uh, interesting guy named Philip, Philip Lawn. He's an Australian economist. And he has developed uh, an alternative um, measure of well-being. He calls it the GPI, the Genuine Progress Indicator. It takes into account a variety of things, uh, including benefits surrounding uh, investments in climate, cost benefits, uh, you know, a more comprehensive uh, way to think about, you know, how to, how to talk about a country's improvements in national well-being over time. And he's trying to get the OECD, World Bank, others to, you know, adopt. Because he's built this stuff out and it's sort of there for the taking if he could get, um, you know, broader interest in disseminating and tracking measures like this. I think it's important. Something that... Can um, I... Can, sorry. Oh, sorry, Brian. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to play devil's advocate for just a second, Stephanie, on this. You see, the problem with capitalism is that whatever indicators you and I create and follow, uh, the fact of the matter is that if you are indebted uh, as an individual, as a company, as a household, and you have a, a mortgage that is um, not performing and you have people trying to foreclose on your house, or if you are a finance minister, because I've, I've had that terrible experience, and uh, uh, you have to grow your tax revenue in order to try to to pretend that you're repaying a debt that can never be repaid, then whatever indicators uh, wonderful economists come up with, they're irrelevant. Uh, so the, 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 this is me playing Devis Dev, Dev advocate. Uh, we need far more radical change than that. Mm. We need to have major debt restructuring, both at the private and the public level, for countries that don't have the exorbitant privilege of the United States, you know, our country here cannot print our own currency, as you know. Therefore, we cannot go through the process of creating money the way you described um, the Fed being able to. Um, uh, there are many countries around the world, either because they're not printing their own currency or because they are borrowing in a currency that they're not printing. Uh, so, I will shut up with two questions. The first one is for, uh, primarily for Naomi. We have three economic blocks. We have the United States, major economic blocks. The United States, the European Union, and China. How far away are each one of them, or how close are they, to your notion of a Green New Deal? Uh, and that's, yeah, that's one question. The second question is, can we ever imagine being able, through simply macroeconomic means, to ameliorate for the fact that the Mr. Peels of the world given the ownership structure of capitalist corporations, will always have the power and the motivation uh, to be austerian in order to prevent the masses, the many, from gaining power. I'm going to push back on Giannis's pushback, because <laughs> to say that we need different metrics is not to say choosing a different metric and then you, you're done, right? Switch metrics and you don't have to do anything else to make material improvements. The idea of the genuine progress indicator, the way I think about it, is that it helps to do what Brian was just talking about, right? We have to see each other and we have to see the problem. So if we had, you know, I'm just using the genuine progress indicator as an example, but it's like a mirror. It forces you to hold a mirror up to the country and to evaluate where are you falling short across a whole range of things that you're paying attention to? And in terms of, you know, the idea that capitalism is always going to be, you know, riddled with these flaws, that it is by design a system which is oppressive to those who find themselves at will workers, right? You, you, are, you are a worker who, um, off, you know, usually has your health care tied to your employment, you are, um, you can, you know, wake up one morning with a job and wake up the next day without a job and without the health care and all the other things. So one of the things that I would love to see us making more progress on is moving toward, you know, something like an FDR Economic Bill of Rights, where you do establish public options. 
a public option in the labor market, public option in banking, so that you have you know the freedom to opt out of uh, financial relationships with Wall Street banks or whatever it is, public option in education, public colleges and universities becoming tuition free, gives agency, right? Um, knowing that you have a secure retirement, that you don't have to depend upon 401ks and other uh, investment schemes to try to build some sense of security for you know, your later years in life, this is what, and 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 a right to a, a clean environment, a job at a decent wage, you know, all of the things that FDR talked about, those were things that Senator Sanders in his campaign, you know, put forward as part of his platform, that people ought to have basic rights secured in these areas. And I think, you know, it's still capitalism, but I, I guess I was brought up uh, very much on Minsky and Hyman Minsky, I think one of the great economists of the last century, Minsky used to say there are as many varieties of capitalism as Heinz has pickles, you know, and the Heinz pickles slogan is 57 varieties. So you have the kinds of capitalism that failed badly leading up to the Great Depression, the kind of capitalism that FDR helped to build that, you know, produced better outcomes for millions of people, rising incomes and, and better economic conditions and better labor conditions and so forth. And then as we whittle those away over the years from Reagan, especially on, uh, then finance capitalism and, and a harsher version. And so I think there are just ways to, um, to you know, introduce safeguards, various protections for people that get us to, um, you know, the kind of a world that I think we're all talking about trying to build. Except, Stephanie, that if you give a public option to the labor market, uh, you're effectively allowing workers to do what Mr. Peel's workers did and therefore collapse capitalism. I don't believe you can give a genuine public option, and I'm all for it, giving a genuine public option to workers in the labor market without actually collapsing the labor market. But That's why, you know, uh, my, my, my dogma, if you want, because I'm not, we don't have time to discuss it, is that you can't really get rid of austerity until you get rid of tradable shares. But that's another discussion, I'm sure. <laughs>